Hello everyone, this is Aldir Gracindo from Brazil. I hope uh, it's everything okay there with you. I seldom uh, speak English nowadays, so <clears throat> forgive me if I stumble on grammar and pronunciation or if I read bad, <laughs> uh, badly. Uh, I am going to at least try to be intelligible. I work with the A Voice for Men crew. Uh, I worked and I still do. And I'm the former editor of the AVFM's branch in Portuguese language. When I commented with the fellow MRAs on AVFM about the theme of this talk, I heard it was interesting and that I should do it. Well, um, you, you people tell me later. Now, we know AVFM specializes not in changing law or judicial battles, but in culture. We know. Others don't. We often see some guys accusing MRAs of catering to women or to the state. Sometimes stupid and dishonest just comes with the, in, in the same package. A voice for men is about changing the narrative, giving men a different vision about who and what they are as men and to society this different vision of men, basically <clears throat> men as human beings. Many times we've seen Paul repeat that He even said that if you look at all these so many articles on A Voice for Men, you won't find a single call for signing a petition to change a law. Well, I supported at least one petition to change a law. And why did I do it? Not for the sheer submissive love for the fictitious person of the state. This I can assure you. Um, Uh, I very often people come to the site and pages in, on, in social media such as Facebook and ask us to support petitions to change laws, to go out of the internet, to talk to politicians, to do some rallies and other actions they sometimes want to see done in real life and don't have the, the bravery uh, enough to do it themselves or <clears throat> Sometimes, and more importantly, these people want some support uh, for their own initiatives. Many people are very naive or don't have knowledge about the, the difficulties of this, let's call, the, the, let's call it, game. The problem is not the misandric, gynocentric laws. The problem is, indeed, cultural. And it is built upon biological predisposition. You, we all tell that all the time, right? Despite that, and actually because of that, I decided to support, uh, publish, share petitions and talk to politicians. Some MGTOWs, uh, some MGTOW, uh, once asked me about what I do, how I do it, why I do it, how do I think things could change, And I told them, uh, well, one thing that I experiment on is chaos theory and game theory. That might seem nerdy. Actually, however, it's just another way to describe what men's rights activists do all the time. Now, next I am going to mention uh, mathematics, but nobody, as you will see, needs to be a skilled mathematician to understand human social interactions. They are simple and also complex, but that is just a fact of life, is a fact of humanity. Chaos theory is a branch of mathematics applicable to different areas, including myth myth meteorology. I should take this word, but I didn't. Okay. Stock, stock marketing, sociology, physics, computer science, political science, uh, psychology, and philosophy. It's interdisciplinary and works with very complex scenarios that seem random, but often have deterministic causalities. I think it's fair to say that human society is a complex system that seems random, but has deterministic causes and effects. The fact that the causes and effects are uh, in the relation between causes and effects are too many doesn't mean that they are not there, that they are not real. 
just that there is an enormous number of variables leading not exactly to unpredictable truths, but uh, just to predict the results inside a complex multivariable scenario can be very challenging. Very challenging. It seems fair to me to suppose that every phenomenon in human societies have cause and effects, and causes and effects, only we might not know them all because the variables influencing each one of them are just too many. Nevertheless, any input to the, to, to the system can have smaller, bigger, or totally game-changing effects so petitions, documentaries, such as the red pill, interviews, social media insertions, the polemic satires of Paul Elon, rallies, judicial, judicial uh, mediatic, political events are inputs to the social, cultural, political system. They are causes as they are effects. Game theory is the study of mathematical models of strategic interactions among rational players where each person advances or gains uh, advances or gains are affected by the decisions made by others to put this uh, simply and its uh, its practical application it's about prediction predicting actions and reactions of other players to better inform decisions, decision making for you as a player. So what is here called game uh, is not uh, a game situation only, uh, though the poker game comes to mind, since uh, they say when you play poker, you're not playing cards, you are playing the other players. Well, game theory can be applied to any situation involving social interactions. That's actually what it is for. Policies to fight crime, police interroga uh, interrogation of suspects and judici judicial disputes and political disputes. Public uh, managers can use statistics and other data to predict and implement policies to reduce crime. Police can predict the reactions of suspected criminals they are going to interrogate, so they can bluff about having testimonies, co co collaborations of accomplices or evidence that uh, they actually don't have, so that this suspect can give, will give, will be willing to give uh, details, evidence and confession in exchange for a reduced sentence. Lawyers, law, lawyers and prosecutors can anticipate their opponents' uh, judicial strategies and act preventively. Actually, you could use game theory in all your personal interactions with other people, right? Uh, but I think that would be crazy. There is a famous hypothetical situation in game theory, a situation of competitive and not cooperative game uh, called the prisoner's dilemma. The prosecutor offers a deal, a deal to two prisoners who are not allowed to talk to each other or see each other. Any one of them uh, who first turns the other, turns against the other prisoners, uh, uh, prisoner for another uh, uh, part of the crimes uh, can have a good reduction in his sentence or go free. The prisoner who will, uh, who will not be the first to turn against the other will have a bigger uh, sentence in consequence. Uh, in case none of them turns against the other, of course, they could just keep the sentence they are already, already in, already in prison for. Uh, but uh, now each one of them has to predict the other's decision very quickly. Anyway, that's just hypothetic. I have a uh, more interesting story to tell because it is uh, a real story. In Brazil, as you may know, former President Lula of the work Brazilian Workers' Party, the Partido dos Trabalhadores, was condemned 
in an, an extremely disputed case uh, for the biggest corruption scandal in the world's history. During the process, President Dilma Rousseff in, interceded in his favor in a kind of desperate way. She decided to nominate him for a ministerial position in the executive. With that, the process in which he was being accused would have to go to the Supreme Court that we call Supremo Tribunal Federal in Brazil. He would gain time and possible advantages because of hypothetically uh, sympathetic uh, Supreme Court judges nominated by him himself or by Dilma Rousseff, his uh, protégé from the same Workers' Party, Partido dos Trabalhadores. We don't know, know really what could have happened, however, because the task force investigating him, investigating Lula, uh, was tapping the former president's phone. They recorded President Dilma Rousseff in a direct conversation with him, with Lula, and so uh, they knew his strategy or their strategy. They leaked the recording uh, uh, the, to the press, uh, a daredevil, dangerous move from the, uh, the, the, the task force, the prosecution task force, and they really, I, I think, really wanted to keep Lula under the jurisdi ju jurisdiction of that one judge. The judge was uh, the now famous uh, judge Sergio Moro, or Sergio Moro. <clears throat> there was uh, no doubt a level of demoralize, de de demoralization for the judge and the investigation, but for Lula, the public demoralization, the demoralization was much worse. That destroyed his strategy, and not only that, he was later condemned and arrested, despite all the money, initial political support, and a team of lawyers. His political protege, by the way, uh, Dilma Rousseff, later lost the presidency via, um, via political impeachment. What were Sergio Moro and the investigation and accusation task force doing? What were they thinking? Well, I am not the only one who believes they, that they were using game theory every step of the way. They knew what would be the effect on the environment, not only judicial effects, but the political, the social effects of the, 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 of the situation, of leaking the, the, that, uh, that, uh, the, that, that record. Uh, there is a solid literature on the application of game theory to judicial criminal, white collar criminal judicial process. And so we can do, we can also use game theory. Actually, we already do that. We can anticipate, and we do, actions and effects of feminist uh, activism, gynocentric traditionalists, gynocentric culture, politicians, parties, etc. As uh, they being part of the game, we know those actors and the elements of our culture very well. Feminists are easy to predict. They repeat the same things. Uh, we know they, uh, they are repetitive arguments and assumptions. They are flawed studies and statistics. The dark history of the feminist movement. We have the facts. We have the arguments. Uh, they are not easy to counteract, though, but they can't. They also they either can't control um, all the variables due to the complexity of the system, the complexity of this cultural, social, political system in where we are also actors, also players. So chaos theory, predicting what they'll do and what we can do against it or not, and how to use their actions and arguments against themselves, that has to do with game theory. Game theory predicts two, kind of, two kinds of situations, cooperative and non-cooperative. To us, however, the chaos theory of a complex 
apparently randomic system comes to mind and I think it's very meaningful and very applicable, very useful. Sometimes the relation between us and other actors is one of cooperation. Sometimes networking is what we have to do. Sometimes it is a, a, a conflict relationship. Conflict relationship. Uh, sometimes it's a zero-sum game, sometimes not. Sometimes asymmetrical, sometimes not so much. Sometimes another actor or cultural element is our friend, friend of our goals. And some, uh, uh, for some things, uh, but it, it's an opponent in the next situation. That, that's the case with traditional conservatism, for example. Uh, they are pro-family and supposedly anti-feminist anti in favor of uh, fatherhood and paternity, but they always bring gynocentrism and even gynolatry with them. The relation is cooperative and competitive. And then we have MGTOW. One funny thing that happens in, happened in Brazil involves MGTOW and conservatives. They went into a state of war and never got out of it. I know, that's not surprising. In Brazil, uh, President Bolsonaro approves a record of new misandric laws, and it happens all the time. Once a celebrity, we call her Pituchita, it looks Spanish, right? This is a Spanish word, uh, made the headlines. She posted uh, a video on social media crying and with bruise, bruises in her arms saying she was terribly embarrassed to be doing that video, but she had to do it for the cause of women. For the cause of women. She claimed her former husband had beat her. There was a national commotion and she was a hero, heroine. Uh, until footage made by security cameras she wasn't aware of was released by the police to the press showing her hurting her own arms and with her nails. The accusation of violence was false. President, President Bolsonaro of Brazil is considered a conservative and allied, allied to classic liberalism. The, he nominated Paulo Guedes as his economy minister. Paulo Guedes, Paulo Guedes is an adept to the Chicago School of Economics. The, the day that footage was released, President Bolsonaro was celebrating with his conservative supported supporters and a uh, feminist uh, congresswoman the signature by him of yet another new law. It was, it was created in the Congress and in, in he has to sign uh, later or, or else the Congress can uh, keep the, the, the process and make the, 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 the project into law uh, without the president. Anyway, this is how the, 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 the lawmaking process happens here in Brazil. Uh, so he was celebrating with his conservative supporters this signature by him uh, of another yet law for that kind of centrism that we all know, but the people uh, in general tend not to see, that would uh, uh, discriminate criminally against men. In this case, it was a law authorizing police authorities to write a distance, distance, distancing order to any man accused of violence against a woman. No need to go to a judge anymore. All, uh, uh, um, all a woman, any woman, now needs to do in Brazil is go to a police station. The comments on the uh, president's page, however, um, <clears throat> beside the comments of his uh, supporters who were really excited by, by what was going on and uh, celebrating that he was considered uh, by the left as a misogynist and now he's doing this, he's doing even more, right? Uh, however, this, the, the, the comment sections, the section uh, on the page 
was showered by the same observation. That's why MGTOW only grows. People then started asking, what is MGTOW? That's, that was good, right? Uh, it is funny that some conservatives believe that the men's rights activist uh, activism would be, that we would be, uh, allies against MGTOW. Maybe that happened because uh, we don't spew re rhetoric against any kind of relationship, even dating or friendship with women. The actions of a par parcel of MGTOW uh, brings a group of traditional conservatives to know me, to know the men's rights movement, and to talk to me. They came to talk to me, really. Some MGTOW even think that they do all the work, you know, so that us, MRAs, can afterwards have all the glory. Anyway, um, little by little, with information and sound reason, reasoning, some traditional conservatives uh, come to our side. Others don't. They are too gynocentric, actually. They will hate us for their whole lives. In game theory, there is the concept of Nash equilibrium. Nash equilibrium happens when you uh, can gain more when none of the players need to change their way, their strategy. What better describes the reality of men's and boys' rights advocates, uh, in my perception, is that game theory, but we have to be aware of the cha chaotic reality to game theory, then inside chaos theory environment, inside a chaos theory environment. It may appear to be random initially, but it is just complex. It may appear to be impossible, but sometimes it's just challenging and sometimes it's just costly. We are uh, in, in resources or in time. We have to learn as we go. The more we acquire knowledge from people like Warren Farrell, Angry Harry, Paul Elam, Peter Wright, MGTOW thinkers, historians, authors, such as Antonio Gramsci, Saul Alinsky, Sun Tzu, Martin Van Kravold, feminist authors too, and, and, and so on. The more we know the environment, the relationships, the relations between causes and effects, culture and individuals and vice versa, and better players we can be. As Sun Tzu says, if you know yourself, the enemy and the terrain, you will win every battle. I am getting back to knowing yourself and your environment soon uh, when I, 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 I tell you about how I became a sort of a sort of sub-sub-celebrity. I became famous here in Brazil. Now I can uh, get back to that petition uh, I told you about in the beginning because this is a, uh, a good real example, real life example of what I'm saying. The petition was to change the law, increasing the sentence for false and intentional accusations of sexual violence. And what happened to the petition? It was, it made its way to the Congress. Uh, and then it was sent to a, a, uh, the, the Congress Gender Commission formed only by, by only uh, feminist Congress women who quickly discussed it and archived it and killed it. So what's the point of doing it, right? Well, it was not just a matter of creating a petition online. The biggest feminist page in the world, uh, with me among its editors, was the first to share it. How big uh, was the biggest anti-feminist page, you, you could uh, uh, ask? Uh, well, it was more than a million followers, until Facebook finally cancelled it. How did we get that big? With provocative and silly memes, ridiculing the incoherence of, uh, of feminists, mainly. Uh, but the left uh, also, right? The page was 
uh, uh, was the, the editors of the page were all uh, right-wing conservatives, libertarians. Um, ridicule is too often stronger than rational argument, as Saul Alinsky, Saul Alinsky mentions. We also had a group of editors, they, they were made um, of conservatives, traditionalists, and libertarians cooperating. We did not agree in everything. We had many fights among us, sometimes co cooperative game or interactions, sometime, sometimes competitive game or interaction. <clears throat> the petition was created by a conservative and libertarian-leaning newbie politician or wannabe politician at the time. The false accusation stories shown on that page were so many. The sharing was so big the adherence to the petition was just remarkable. As a consequence, the idea was resurrect re resurrected by a congressman later, not yet approved. And the same idea keeps coming back every time a famous case of parental alienation and false allegation of domestic or, or sexual violence comes to the public attention, it brings, brings back the memory of the blatant injustice, insanity, violence, torture and murder of children, danger to oneself, to yourself, to your father, to your brother, to your sons, to, and the social harm of gynocentric, misandric legislation, family courts, etc. It hits uh, really too close to home to so many people. This year, in our local county elections, the legis just legislative uh, chamber uh, uh, county elections, parental alienation um, and even false allegations and uh, men's rights as a whole became a discussed issue, even though not as much as, much at, as, as we would like. Some politicians started, uh, politicians started to be interested in this because the public is talking about it. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes a petition is not just a petition. That was the point of that petition. And that's why chaos theory and game theory have everything to do with us. The effect of our incisions in the complex social, cultural, political system can be measured by observation. The observation of the effects in culture. We search to create butterfly effects or domino effects. This uh, is just strategic attempts, game theory, inside the current complex chaotic, cha chaotic social system, chaos theory. Because of networking and dialogue, even though I am myself sometimes an arrogant acid fellow, that uh, uh, prompted other people to support and ally to us. A VFM in Portuguese page on Facebook got more than 20,000 followers, um, which is half of the following uh, of the, the former international AVFM uh, page on Facebook. The point of chaos theory is that no matter from where you bring elements to the cultural and social system, you are sending our message. The men's rights, uh, men's rights or human rights uh, or men's human rights uh, movement uh, narrative on the humanity and dignity of men and boys. It doesn't really matter if you do it from the bottom or in the bottom. Uh, in the, from the middle, from any side, or from the top. It doesn't need to be a petition. Just like in this example, it was a petition. You can be effective. Still, the AVFM operation, o o operational, operational concept is spot on. In the end, it's all about culture. The point of, the ga of game theory is that uh, its strategies are very much applicable in, in the activism and advocacy for men's rights. This is our everyday thing. It's about uh, knowing the environment, 
the elements in action, predicting the other player's moves and uh, uh, knowing the consequences of each move, and use it all to have gains for the cause, for the cause of men and boys. Our conservative exec uh, executive has a minister of women, family and human rights. Uh, if you are thinking that women can f come first, family in second, and human rights in third, uh, I, I would agree with you. This is actually what they are saying, even though they don't, uh, they are not so explicit, more explicit. Um, why women are special case not included among humans, and uh, where are the boys and men in this, you might also be asking, and you are very much right to ask. Some supporters of the men's rights movement, or men's rights uh, activists, we, we could call them, um, here in Brazil, went to Congress and to this uh, ministry, and uh, they talked to, uh, talked to many people actually finding sympathetic, sympathetic listeners. Some women started talking about uh, men's issues, uh, about badly informed laws and policies, and the numbers, the statistics uh, about it that are not mentioned in the media, in the mainstream media at least, uh, on YouTube and other platforms. I thought it would be good to have a male face and voice on it. So I started to, po to post more my own name and photo on AVFM in Portuguese page. My conversation with uh, a very well-known Brazilian Christian conservative anti-feminist um, uh, politician, her name is Ana Carolina Campagnolo, made a bigger number of conservatives to know and support a, a big part of them, uh, the men's rights movement and my work. A famous, famous uh, libertarian-leaning website in Brazil called Spotniks invited me to talk to a feminist in a video they posted on Facebook. The format was, we put a feminist and a men's rights activist to talk without them knowing. Uh, that means without any of us knowing uh, what was the ideological view of the other? We could only suppose, because we, we knew what it was all about, uh, that those uh, perspectives uh, would be opposed in something. Uh, it's a very interesting thing, this. Uh, I don't know if you have seen this in any other place, but uh, the idea uh, is that people with different views, political, ideological views, um, they can attack each other, right, and not treat each other really like uh, as people, as humans, but we are all humans. So what would happen if you put uh, these two people to talk as just people, and slowly they, uh, they get to know what is the difference, what, what are the differences between them, right? Um, that video went viral uh, and now has more than point. 0.6 million views. In part, just prepare yourselves for this. Uh, what made the video so viral was that the feminist seemed, less, let's say, charmed by me in the video. Uh, people thought there was uh, just some chemistry in the air between me and the feminist. Well, she was uh, a, a quite pleasant uh, person to talk to. I can say that, until the questions we were supposed to ask each other and uh, guess each other's answers. Um, in, in, in one of these questions, I, I said what I thought about feminism. I said, I think feminism is cancer. She was surprised and, and mortified. She actually left the place as soon as she could. I could see uh, that she wasn't feeling well at all. It was like if someone had died, really. But see, uh, I, I wasn't impolite to her in any time, at all. She felt bad because of my criticism of uh, feminism, of feminist ideology. This happens all the time when we talk to feminists. If we attacked feminism, we attacked feminist ideology, 
they feel as a personal attack to them. Anyway, after that, many people who had never heard about the men's rights movement now know it exists. I, and I went from being called a voice for men's out there to the, the, the men's rights activist or, <coughs> and also the Chad activist. Well, they are not entirely wrong, right? Um, uh, you're not laughing. Thank you. Thank you for not laughing. Uh, I had to adapt uh, also to Brazil's legal environment. Some lawyers that support my work advised me not to offend people personally, not to call them names, for example, because not, uh, not only Brazilian, le not only of Brazilian legislation, but also uh, uh, because of how Brazilian jurisprudence goes. Jurisprudence? Okay, uh, I think I, I, I said it clearly, right? Uh, so I adapted to the local environment in a national level. We can call it a national system or uh, a human subsystem, right? I also had to adapt to myself. You know, like um, you, um, Warren Farrell, uh, you are not as Texan as Paul Elam. Uh, and Paul Elam didn't create a party and doesn't uh, act uh, through a party as Mike Buchanan in, in, in the United Kingdom. And uh, people tell me that I look like a pickup artist, which uh, I am not, really, I assure you. Each of us has his own personality and style and con can contribute in different ways. Talking gently and politely was a way I had to help our, our cause. And uh, being part of a right-wing uh, coalition page was also one way. And uh, I, I do this just like many of us do in, in our own places. Some people of the so-called Red Pill community uh, hate what I do and how I do it. Too gentle, too cute for them. For the feminists, obviously psychopath, womanizer, manipulator. We here also have that kind of MGTOW who can't accept that, men, that the MRM includes women, but we do that and that's it, right? Doesn't matter. You may be a nerd, an academic, a meme maker, a writer. Uh, you are part of what we do in your own way. People here are also trying to associate to fight judicial battles for innocent men falsely accused uh, and alienated from their children. A lot of memes were made mocking the situation uh, of, of the video that went, vir went, went uh, viral with the feminist. Uh, one of them reads, we put a feminist and a, a human being to talk without them knowing. <coughs> Uh, and another in response uh, uh, reads, we put a feminist and a schizophrenic to talk. I don't know which one is more cruel anyway, uh, Spot, but uh, Spotniks uh, even invited me to take part of another video. Women are privileged. Change my mind. <coughs> there was so much repercussion that uh, Facebook and Instagram banned my account. Hooray. Uber drivers and people on the street compliment me now. Some hate me, but most people, as I see, they respect the message. I consider, actually, my experience in Brazil a very privileged one, and I say this with no modesty, no humility at all. Uh, I wanted the MRM to be known and acknowledged. I had outstanding help from others. I tried it and I got it. Just like many of you in your own communities, online and in real life, did or do. The men's rights movement now is known by many politicians, journalists and social media influencers with a national reach, actually. Some of them consult what we write. They get information they did not have before. Even places our names don't go, where our names don't go, our ideas go. Did anyone there think of Antonio Gramsci and his hegemony theory? 
Well, uh, anyway, I guess that's enough for now. I hope you found uh, this somewhat interesting and uh, informative. I am glad and thankful I had the opportunity to tell some news about the men's rights movement in Brazil and also to hear from others. Thanks to Mike Buchanan, Paul, Paul Elam, Robert Brockway, all the organizers, and thank you all very much. Cheers from Brazil. <laughs>